A brilliant, brilliant film. Quite sad, that, but um, good film. Enjoy that. Uh, no film with a book movie next week. Instead, at 20 to 1, we have an episode of Matlock for you. The film with a book movie returns in three weeks' time with the movie Butterfly. Next tonight, the news. a happy one, as we can see by the condition of this particular human. Overeating, overdrinking, yes, it's all coming back now. Thankfully, help is at hand. Resolve with paracetamol for headache, antacid for upset stomach, glucose, and vitamin C. So at least you know you're going to live. Resolve, the all-in-one remedy for the morning after. At Stoll's of Chelsea, we judge a good wine by its nose. Grapes first planted by the Romans produced a robust nose for our Cote du Rhone village. From the Sèvres men comes our crisp and flowery muscadet. From Bordeaux, our superior claret with its generous bouquet. From Germany, our fragrant Nierstein Agutis Domptar, wonderful chill. And from the sunny French slopes of the Tarn, a medium dry white with a delicate aroma. Stoles of Chelsea, 11 different noses to choose from. The Atari 520ST has twice the power of many business micros. It handles business with ease. It can paint pictures and make them move. It can play advanced games. Yet it costs less than 300 pounds. Or get the new 520 power pack with 23 great software titles. Well, hello again. It's uh, just gone 20 to 3 on a Monday morning. You're watching Late Night Late on both TVS and Channel Television. Uh, next tonight, after the latest news headlines, we'll be joining Rob Jones, who's this week, uh, week's guest presenter, on Pick of the Week, looking at the best bits of regional television. And in half an hour's time, we'll look at science and technology in Beyond 2000. As I say, though, all that coming up after the latest news headlines from Richard Bath at ITN in London. <laughs> Czechoslovakia's Central Committee has met again in emergency session, the second time in three days. And thousands of people joined together to form a human chain across Prague. The line meandered up through the woods to Prague Castle, where the human links broke up and went home after an extraordinary day. It began with the early morning release from custody of a number of leading dissidents. But at least 20 others arrested recently are still being held. Late morning and Václav Havel, the dissident playwright and figurehead of civic reform, was leading an opposition alignment across Prague for an historic meeting with the Czechoslovak Prime Minister. Here, civic forum, with a package of demands including a release of all dissidents by next week, were in open and direct dialogue with the head of government, Mr. Ladislav Adamets. A new link had been forged. <laughs> Later, Ladislav Adametz addressed the demonstrators. Cheers turned to booze when he called for Monday's two-hour general strike to be cut to two minutes. The Hungarian opposition parties say they're confident of winning the country's first free referendum for more than 40 years. It's being held to decide how and when a new president will be chosen. The ruling Socialist Party wants the election to be held in January. Later this week, Britain's first trainee astronauts leave for Russia for 18 months intensive training to prepare them for the Juno mission. Major Tim Mace and food scientist Helen Sharman were selected from 13,000 British hopefuls. 
Only one of them will actually go up into space, the other will do work back on the ground. Liverpool lead the first division on goal difference after beating Arsenal 2-1 at Anfield. Liverpool dominated the first half, just missing a goal two minutes in. McMahon eventually found a gap in the defence to put Liverpool one up. Arsenal fought back in the second half, but it was Barnes who put Liverpool two ahead with a free kick. Arsenal finally scored through a shambles in Liverpool's defence. And we'll be back with the morning news at five o'clock. See you then. Thanks very much indeed, Richard. Well, don't forget, just before the morning news and just after 4.30, this little chap will be along. ALF, yes, uh, episode two in Someone to Watch Over Me. And there's the results of the ALF competition. We'll be announcing the lucky winners of these. And, and this rather special ALF, the talkative one. Hey, give me four! <laughs> I love that. There'll be more from him later. If you enter that competition, good luck. Answers, as I say, just before that at 4.35. Now, pick of the week. Hello, I'm Rob Jones, welcoming you to half an hour of tradition and heritage, otherwise known as Pick of the Week. Yeah, I know Pick of the Week doesn't always make such claims, but this week is different. We have art, courtesy of one of Britain's best-known artists. There's theatre, as we find out what Kate O'Mara had to uh, get off her chest. We've music, too. The Land of My Fathers. And a tradition of our own, the great film giveaway. But we start off tonight's programme with the story of another great British tradition, the eccentric inventor. Shelley Hunt of TVS met the man who thought pigs could fly. At a secret location somewhere in Bournemouth Airport, Pegasus is having its final pre-flight preparations. Wings are fixed into place. The engine gets a final once-over, and lights have a last check. After weeks of preparation, inventor Adrian Wareham is ready to make aviation history. Pegasus is set to prove that pigs really might fly. Out on the runway, Bournemouth Airport Fire Brigade are taking no chances, but Adrian is obviously completely confident in his flying machine. I'm going to lift off today. Even, it may only, be, um, may, may only be a foot or two, may only be an inch or two, but I'm going to get off the ground. Where are you going to fly to if you really get off the ground? I'll by? probably do a fly? circuit around the airport and uh, then come back. It's a beautiful day for uh, flying pigs. It's taken Adrian four weeks to build Pegasus from bits of scrap metal and a 50cc engine. Eventually, he hopes to sell it to raise money for charity. It's the latest in a long line of inventions. Last year, he hit the headlines with Virginia, the perfect woman. But even after last-minute flight checks, Pegasus is proving to be a bit of a pig's ear. Pegasus is still for takeoff. The uh, wind 230 at 12. Not above hedge height, please. lift as we ought. Um, I didn't anticipate it getting a lot higher than this. Um, I'm not sure, maybe the wings are a little too small, but I'm going to get the rockets out now and attach those and um, I'm sure we'll be able to get enough lift. But like all good inventors, Adrian's thought of everything and if this doesn't get Pegasus off the ground, well nothing will. But it seems you can lead a pig to the airport but you can't make it fly. From one eccentric to another, I have a feeling the flying pig will be very much at home in the hands of Jim Harrison, who, in his own way, is probably as offbeat as Adrian Wareham. Mike Blair of Central News went to meet him. Jim Harrison is a man who takes a real pride in his work. He enjoys it so much, he's even built an ornamental garden to brighten things up. You can even call it a load of garbage, and he won't mind, because that's exactly what it is. Jim's pride and joy is a floral oasis in the middle of a rubbish tip. I'm a born titivator, and uh, I've got this, uh, different things came in and I've got different ideas about it, so I thought I'd t 
tidy the old place up, because there's nothing worse than going to a tip that looks like a tip. Now, this doesn't look like a tip now. It just tidies it all up, and folks get uh, an amuse, amusement out of it, and it's a lot more pleasant to come to the tip. The tip near Ashbourne in Derbyshire is now something of an attraction. People come from miles around to dump their rubbish and stare in wonder at Jim's garden and cuddly toys. Do people get very surprised when they actually turn up here and see this little oh, garden and see the very, stuffed animals? Some of them very surprised. In fact, they pass the tip sometimes thinking it, it isn't a tip, but uh, the, the local ones that use it readily, they, uh, they quite often go to the skips down there and come up here and just stop and have a look at the garden. And In fact, people are even donating toys and ornaments to help decorate the site. It has gotten now, as people have seen it, and they'll quite often come in with a big teddy bear they don't want of some sort, and I usually find it at home. <laughs> I don't know where he gets them all from. I, I suppose one or two children have put them in the bin and uh, forgotten about them, but it seems a shame, but it's nice to, to brighten the place up. I think it's smashing, I do. I think it's lovely for the children when they come down with their parents to, to see all these teddy bears, and uh, I think he's really got it very nice indeed. And the only blight in Jim's Garden of Eden, people will keep dropping rubbish all over the place. Obviously, when it's windy and things, you do get paper blown about, but we have to keep topside of it best we can, and, uh, you know, we, we do all right with it anyway, we manage. And most people do treat it as they see it, uh, keep it tidy anyway. So you don't mind people bringing their rubbish down as long as they put it away neatly? As long as you put it away neatly, that's it, yeah. I wonder what Jim would make of this studio. He'd probably feel very much at home. But while we're on the subject of eccentrics, I'm sure those people who think of the Mona Lisa or the Haywain as great works of art would probably put David Hockney firmly in the eccentric category. But Hockney's a man of his time, as he proved with his latest work. Barbara Govan of Yorkshire Television's calendar was at the unveiling. Oh, wow. This crowd of art fans came to Salts Mill in Bradford to watch the artist David Hockney at work. The empty canvas beckoned. The drink flowed in anticipation, but Hockney wasn't there. He was in his studio on the other side of the world, near Los Angeles, preparing to send a specially created work. But First Class Post couldn't explain the excitement at the gallery. What could was almost as unlikely. No, not this, or this, or this, but this. The humble fax machine. Till now, sender and receiver of boring old documents, the office Cinderella took centre stage as purveyor of long-distance art. Tonight we've got a, a theatrical stage built. We know that we're getting a, a programme which will entertain. We know it's a picture, and there's a clue on the stage which if you pick up whilst you're here, you'll know what it is. There's also a red herring. And most important of all, we will get a very serious picture sent flying across the Atlantic via a satellite. Do you know what the picture's going to be? Uh, we've got a clue, which is sporting but not swimming. There you are. Yeah, that's just come from David. There's a message from him. This is the first part, saying that they're starting now. So, piece by piece, with invisible hand, David Hockney sent his mystery picture. Guided by map-type references, it slowly took shape. David's mum, Laura, looked on, but she really was there in a ringside seat. Brother John, also an artist, joined in the hands-on experience. Followed by sister Margaret. She suffers from deafness, a problem David Hockney shares. So he's specially fond of the facts and has bought them for his family and tried out his art experiment on them. Well, the centre's one picture and it's got about 24 pieces in it. We kept coming, they were all exciting and um, we put them together on the, on the floor. We were trying to work out what it was and I thought it was one thing, Ken thought it was something else. So we'd better find out what it really is. Telephone David. It's marvellous now, we've got it, but what is it? Is it this or is it that? I said it's whatever you want it to be. So what of our emerging picture? Would there be embarrassed calls to LA for explanation? I've no idea at all. I'll find out when it finishes. I uh, love the picture, love the picture, because it's looking, it's looking increasingly like my suit. It took nearly two hours to complete, but since Hockney seems to approve of electronic technology, we've used a bit of ours to bring the finished article to you.
Well, I'm sorry, but despite all the clues, I've got to ask, what is it? And no, that's not this week's Pick of the Week quiz. Anyway, from one star of the canvas to another, although that's not really fair, Frank Bruno rarely ends up on the canvas. But plenty of people who've met him do. However, he was showing the gentler side of his nature when Gary Cotterell of TBS's Coast to Coast chatted to him. The star performers of today's 10-step challenge in Southampton, all of them starting out in the world of sport. Well, almost all of them. Big Frank Bruno taking part in the day of activity aimed at showing 8- to 10-year-olds how much fun physical fitness can be. Our Frank joined other sports stars in a team to take on the youngsters. Don't hit me though, right? Frank's first opponent, eight-year-old Jane Pilcher. Don't worry, it's not a boxing match, it's a beanbag gathering race. And Frank, for once, is disadvantaged by boxing gloves. <laughs> then all set for the next race, the slalom, and Frank, for a change, floored in the first minute. Next, the medicine ball throwing. Frank, well beaten by an eight-year-old. If with a somewhat lighter projectile. One lesson our cameraman learned, never get in Frank's way when he's throwing. Or talking. Or even jumping. You're over there somewhere. Yes, Gary, I'm over here. Yes, or Harry, whatever you want to be called. It's Gary and Frank. Oh, right, Harry. Yes. <laughs> it's a bit different from uh, facing Tyson in the ring, all this. Yeah, you can say that again. They're like, they're miniature Tysons, you know what I mean? It's a bit very more miniature. dangerous, actually. Yeah, they are very dangerous, you know what I mean? If you don't sign the autographs, they will give you a kick in the shin, you know? Well, there you are. Proof that beating Frank Bruno is child's play. And talking of child's play, that is what many of you have found the Pick of the Week quiz just lately. So the bad news is that this week we're going to make the question a tiny bit harder. The good news is that if you win, not only will there be a fabulous video winging its way to your home, there will also be a Pick of the Week sweatshirt. More of that in part two, along with Kate O'Mara with uh, something to get off her chest. <laughs> Golden Wonder Pots. Pots of choice, pots of warmth, and pots of taste. Ah! When you need a hot filling snack. Good evening. What's stopping you? There's something enlightened about a man who uses a brawn shaver. He can see what makes brawn the world's best-selling foil shaver. Like the System 123, with the latest rechargeable technology and three-position switch. With its platinum-plated foil for unbeatable closeness. Even in those difficult-to-reach places. Giving you a totally refreshed side effect. Brawn shavers feel the difference. Welcome back. There can be few parts in Britain as beautiful as North Wales. But what do you expect from a boy called Jones? But the splendour is not all natural. Shelley Roder and Ian Skidmore of Granada Reports explain. You wouldn't think, would you, that we're about two hours away from Manchester, but you would think that this is one of the seven wonders of Wales, and it is. Pistich Ryder. The word actually means waterfall, waterfall. The seven wonders of Wales is a poem that um, perhaps any Welshman could quote for you, but not many know that it was actually written by an Englishman, the famous dictionary maker, Dr. Johnson, who came here in the 18th century with his friends, the Thrales, and their abominable daughter, Queenie. He was so rude. He was rude about everything. Until at Bedrothen, Mrs. Thrale was so sick as she was getting out of her coach. She said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. He said, Madam, you are over civil. <laughs> and she said, you must recall, I have to be civil for poor people.
Because it might look natural, but in fact, all that cliff there is landscaped. The left bank is owned by Lord Powys, and the right bank by Sir Watkin Williams Wynne. Incidentally, it's the only family with its own pudding. Only pudding? Yes, the Watkin Williams Wynne pudding is absolutely delicious. But tell me more about it being landscaped. You mean they actually designed the waterfall? Well, yeah, th this it's is... a designer waterfall. It's a designer waterfall, you see. Um, I'm going back now to the 19th century, of course. And these rowan trees and the ferns. And you can see there are trees there that are not indigenous. And they were put in during that splendid time when people actually liked the countryside and liked to improve it. Mm. Very noble effort. I think they make quite a good job, don't you? I do. What about that hole in the middle? Was that uh, put in as well? That was put in by a chap called God. Where does it all go to? Well, it goes down the Tanner, through the valley, into the Kiriog, and comes out of a tap somewhere in Birmingham. You've written a book called Glendower Country. Mm. What is Glendower Country? Roughly, it's the kingdom of the medieval Welsh prince Owen Glendower. Uh, it's the Dee Valley, the Clwyd Valley, the Tanant and the Kerryon. I know you're biased, but is it the most beautiful part of Wales? It's going to be awfully difficult to go to heaven. I'm a bit of a letdown. Now you know where the phrase keeping up with the Joneses comes from. Where else but Wales could you find a designer waterfall? Now, as I mentioned earlier, tonight's show is all about heritage and tradition. And we have a story now about a Welsh family that seem to be creating a little tradition of their own, one they'd like not to continue. Nick Partridge of HTV's Wales at Six has a hair-raising story for us. You could say, like father, like son. Only when it comes to hairstyles at the same age, Philip Senior and Philip Junior have very different tastes. Dad, now a barber's delight, chose as a teenager to let it all hang out in the swinging 60s. His son, now 15 and a product of the conservative 80s, chose a smart V-neck short back and sides. But it seems neither's hair suits the exacting standards of St. Cyrus Comprehensive School, where headmasters, a generation apart, have now suspended a Philip Grant. Oh, I think it came to me as a bit of a shock to say the slightest. My uh, son had his hair cut uh, for his cadets which I thought was very neatly done. It doesn't show his hair from under his berry. And uh, it brought back some memories of me of my past life, let us say, that uh, the same school expelled me. But for the opposite thing, mine was too long for the school. So it seems nowadays that people just can't win. It's either too long or it's too short. You obviously don't think there's anything wrong with it? No, there's nothing wrong with it in my case. What do you think about the fact that your dad was suspended all those years ago for having his hair too long? Well, I think that it's... Uh quite amusing that the, our family don't go very well with hairstyles, I think. Do you think he'd approve of your hairstyle now? Uh, maybe mine, no, yes. <laughs> Not as it was at the time. Maybe now he might have approved of as I was before. Maybe he'd be all right now if I had hair all the way down my back, as I had then. Headmaster Brian Rowland said Philip's haircut was considered unacceptable, as presumably his father's was 19 years ago. And that's the long and the short of it. I just wonder whether, when he had that wedding photo taken, the father ever expected he'd end up looking so respectable. Of course, 20 years ago, it was a kind of uniform for groups to look like that. These days, things have changed a bit, but style is still very important. John Molson of Granada Reports met a band who seemed to be doing as well with their clothes as their records. Cow Records. Cow Records, the name of one of Manchester's newest labels. Just one group, but an awful lot of t-shirts. T-shirts have been all the rage in Manchester this year, and the cow empire has cashed in. 50,000 shirts printed, packaged and sold with the name in spiral carpets. They can walk down the street, one of our t-shirts on, yeah, they can walk straight past them and they won't even know I'm in the band. Yeah, it's just a thing on the side. I mean, the music's the most important thing at the end of the day. But, like, if people want to wear one of their t-shirts with the band now, and that's, that's brilliant. With a new single to promote, the carpet's current tour culminates in Manchester next weekend. 
the T-shirts will be out in force. It's quite a big area in Manchester, so there's like loads going on, loads of things to do. There's loads of clubs, you know, loads of places to go see in groups. It's got three uh, good football teams, you know. You're including Stockport? Uh, no, Oldham, actually. Just a small place for bands, really. I mean, you can name, if you just take any, any decade out of the last 50 years, I think well 40 years, you can find smart bands that have come from Manchester, you know. I don't know what it is. Now there's a band who've done well with t-shirts, and so have we. The Pick of the Week t-shirts have been incredibly popular. But last week we offered a special t-shirt from the film Critters 2, along with a video of the film. For the answer to the question, what do the letters E.T. stand for? It's a tricky one. The answer was, of course, extraterrestrial. So let's see who's won. Right, if I'm gone more than ten minutes, send a search party. Right, the winner is an incredibly large envelope, Mr. Anthony Hunt of Locking Road, Western Supermare. Well done, Mr. Hunt. We'll be sending you off the video and the Critters 2 t-shirt in the post. Well done. Now then, as you may have noticed, winter's here, so we've dumped the Pick of the Week t-shirts and replaced them with these. Big, horrible green things. No, sweatshirts. Now, you can't buy them. You can only win one. So this week's quiz, then. First, the film that goes with the sweatshirt. It's a remarkable performance by Meryl Streep in the film based on the true story of the Dingo Baby case, Cry in the Dark. Well, is it not the case that you wrote some sort of thesis on dingoes when no, you were at college? It is not the case. That's a press invention. But that arose from the Women's Day article. Well, I thought it came from a newspaper. Was the Women's Day article accurate? No, it was the most inaccurate article of all, or at least of the ones that I've read so far. In fact, there are only about five reporters who write exactly what you say, and the rest of them use a little bit of license. Perhaps I could read you something from Dr. Brown's report. There were several small cuts in the baby blankets, but there was no evidence of tooth marks. Well, teeth cut, don't they? A forensic dentist finds no evidence of tooth marks. Does that concern you? Well, of course it concerns me. But he doesn't know what caused the cuts. And if he can't say what happened, how can he say what didn't happen? So you're not prepared to accept his expertise in saying that there were no I'm not marks. saying that. I'm saying what I'd like is a full answer, not a half answer. I'd like to know more than anyone else. What happened to my... my baby daughter? Meryl Streep and Sam Neill there in Cry in the Dark. Now, to win it and the sweatshirt, I'd like to know which actor starred with Meryl Streep in the tug of love film Kramer vs. Kramer. It's another tricky one. Which actor starred with Meryl Streep in Kramer vs. Kramer? If you know, send your answer on a postcard or the back of a sealed envelope to Pick of the Week, Yorkshire Television, Leeds LS3 1JS. That's Pick of the Week, Yorkshire Television, Leeds LS3 1JS. And as usual, answer to us as soon as possible, please. Now then, we turn from one remarkable actress to another. Kate O'Mara has made a name for herself in the last few years as one of the sexiest women on television. Alan Hardwick of Yorkshire Television caught up with her recently and discovered that she's no less sexy in the flesh. Good morning, madam. Do you have an appointment? You're new, aren't you? I'm Mr. Main's wife, but I do, in fact, have an appointment. Oh, it's 20 so years sorry, since Kate O'Mara sorry, appeared in the YTV serial it. Main I'm Chance. Sure. Since then, she's become one of the best-known faces on television in this country and in America. But her first love is, and always has been, live theatre, which is why she's in York this week playing Cleopatra at the Grand Opera House. It's a part she originally intended to play topless. Now, I do have one scene where I am vaguely topless or half topless. Um, we did contemplate doing it, uh, quite a lot of it, as it should be done because they were topless in those days, and many of the wall paintings show them that that was the fashion for women. And um, a couple of very famous portraits of Cleopatra show her without any top to her dress. And we thought about this for a while, and then um, we even thought about some male nudity as well, because, again, because it was very much the fashion. And then we thought, oh, dear me, um, maybe not. Maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe it'll be distracting. Maybe they won't listen to the play. And so we decided against it. But it never occurred to us that it would anyway, cause a for all. We just thought it was, we were being authentic, you know, and uh, what a good idea if we did this. 
Which do you prefer? Do you prefer the, the, the small screen television or do you prefer the live audiences in the theatre? Well, I was brought up in the theatre, you see, and uh, it's, I'm a child of the theatre. It's been my life. And um, I don't like television at all, I have to say. Really? No. Despite the, despite the fact that you're very well known to uh, millions of people now for uh, your portrayal in something on the other side, in Howard's Way. Yes, I know. Um, I've, I've been on television over the years, you know, but it's always been something I had to do rather than, I mean, it's a way of earning a living. But you see, I mean, to me there's nothing to uh, surpass a live audience, to have the actual participation of the audience. And they do participate. They're the sort of the, the final ingredient for me, the final element. You know, when the curtain goes up, the actor on the stage sort of pushes out a great surge of energy, hopefully, which is received by the audience, recharged and sent back again. And it becomes a live, it becomes a happening. And you, can't, you just can't have that on television or, or in movies. Seeing Kate O'Mara in her dressing gown there reminds me it's getting rather late. So until next week, when Wincy Willis will be with you, you try saying that without moving your lips. From Pick of the Week and me, Rob Jones, good night. And there's more from Pick of the Week next week at 2.35, round about the same time. Well, next tonight on Late Night Late, we have an hour of science and technology for you in Beyond 2000. And then still to come, just after 4 o'clock this morning, Coast to Coast People. And then it's ALF, Comedy with ALF at 4.35. All coming up this morning on Late Night Late. Science and technology, though, after the break. The human condition is not always a happy one, as we can see by the condition of this particular human. Overeating, overdrinking, yes, it's all coming back now. Thankfully, help is at hand. Resolve with paracetamol for headache, antacid for upset stomach, glucose and vitamin C. So at least you know you're going to live. Resolve, the all-in-one remedy for the morning after. by many of my close personal friends and all the hits on hits are monster hits available now at a store near you make my day buy it it's enormous what did he say tonto him say apache have 100 braves on the side of hill well we faced worse odds than that him also say Braves just have their Weetabix. They just had their Weetabix? And we are in trouble. What's this we business? Pale face? Have you had your Weetabix? The Sony TR55 is a revolutionary new camcorder with power zoom, autofocus, a recording capacity of up to three hours, and hi-fi sound. But you can't see what's most revolutionary about it until you put it in the hand of an adult. The Sony TR55, the smallest camcorder in the world. Well, baby, I'm in the 
And that says it all, doesn't it? Good morning, you're watching Late Night Late. Across the south and southeast of England and the Channel Islands as well. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. If you've got in to win one of these elves, uh, as I say, answers at 4.35 this morning. And if you missed the competition last week, try and get the question right anyway. Which fictional planet does he come from? Answers later, as I say, now beyond 2,000.